Well, 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 you have finally got here. You are listening to the Erskine Music Podcast. Here by popular demand, we discuss life, culture, Christ, and of course, music. These half hour broadcasts are perfect for a commute, coffee time, or chat, idiot. or any other yes, gap in I'm your an schedule. Idiot. So we want to pair to you that line content. as much as possible today. So without Anytime further ado, let's join the conversation, that conversation today. Uh, even if you're just typing jobly books in there, I'm not gonna put it on the screen. But I will acknowledge the fact that you guys are at least trying to get this bump this up the algorithm. This show is doing well. I love the fact that you guys are tuned in and there's an international audience I'm watching this. So give me a shout out. I love to tell the screen where you guys are watching. There's folks that jump on this thing. You too. I love the Facebook audience. I love the live audience. All right, folks, we're back with the enjoying the show. So glad you guys are here. But hey. YouTube, oh. you guys are taking it Somebody away. was telling me the Good morning, day. Miyoshi. Watch your show. Where are you and, watching uh, from, you Miyoshi? To, it really enjoyed you watching sound of several. I was like, I have no idea what you're talking. Are you about. in a place that starts with an N? Are you? I don't know anything about sound effects. That starts with a J. Excellent. Absolutely. Are you in a place that starts with an but I actually T. haven't started using sound effects until you guys. I'm not know sure what that was. Watch the show. All right. So Big Head is also here in the studio today. I'm going to say hello to Man, Big no Head. Big Head is the voice of consciousness as a of the Earth on this show. show oftentimes, it's not me because I don't send any hate mail really, because really of that. You can send me the show, <laughs> because of some of the stuff that I'm going to be saying today. Time you can send me some hate mail part, or some other things that I'm going to be saying today. But we love the dolphins on this show. All right. Yeah. But the show has not fallen apart thus far today because there are probably people who want to watch this episode and they want to know about teachers. And so before we get to that today, let me just first all say that this material that i'm going to be using today is covered under the copyright act of 1976 incidentally i wasn't born in 1976 <laughs> incidentally providentially i wasn't born in 1976 but in 1976 the copyright act uh section 107 of the copyright act allows for the use of fair use fair use did you hear that facebook fair use of things that i'm going to be putting up here you guys didn't necessarily like my tribute to toby mac's new album and so you guys shadow ban that, but not on YouTube. So you go back and watch the YouTube feed of that, and you guys will get a chance to see my album review of Toby Mac. But today we're on a different thing, a uh, different subject. So just flash that up there a couple of times. Big Head, get off the screen. Get off the screen, Big Head. It's time for us to grab our Bibles, and it's time for us to get down to some devotion today. Man, we love the Lord on this show, and we love to uh, just talk about what Jesus is doing. This is Susanna Almoth. And if Susanna, if you're watching this today, anywhere out there, Susanna's people or Susanna's parents, nonetheless, and you're watching me struggle to say her name, just know that my name is Erskine out of Atarte. And I've shortened it now as an artist to just Erskine. And just know that most people in America can't say Erskine. And so I feel your pain. If I have mispronounced your name, I do apologize. The Dolphins apologize for that. Everything. We, we were just super sorry about that. All right, so I don't like sound effects on this show at all. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about this devotion that comes from uh, Susanna Almos' Daily Word Devotion. You know, I mix it up on here. Sometimes I use some of the guys. I bring some of the ladies on their devotional thoughts. And this one's about people-pleasing. And I thought, how appropriate for us to really look at this whole aspect of people-pleasing against the backdrop of... Well, teaching is the ultimate <laughs> trying to please people profession. You've got students that you've got to try to please. You've got parents that you've got to try to please. You've got administrators that you've got to try to please. You've got bus drivers that you've got to try to please. You've got lunch ladies that you've got to try to please. Probably won't use that sound effect again. But I have to tell you a lunch lady story at some point. But let's get to the devotion for today. This is Susanna Almoth. And she says, I have been known to make up scenarios and conversations in my, my head about what I believe people are thinking about when they think I have disappointed them. I also like to reimagine conversations that I think have gone poorly, as she calls them conversation do-overs. Sadly, I'm much more brilliant in my do-over conversations than I am in my real life conversations. Raise your hand if you, anybody's like that. That's me. Okay. She goes on to say that I'm convinced that this is not the way that Jesus meant for me to live because it is not how he lived. Jesus only cared about one person. He cared about his dad. 
everything Jesus did revolved around what his dad wanted, God, <laughs> what he liked, what he valued, what he asked Jesus to do. So her response to this, and I would say this is garden variety, say yes to God. She said, I'm trying to follow his lead. I'm stepping out of what ifs and wonders that swirl around in my brain and the firm truth of the father's love. If I have, if I really want to spend my days worried about pleasing someone, shouldn't it be him? If I am pleasing him, if I am living for him, if I am following his direction, then I don't have to worry about whether people like me or what I do, or what I say, because I'm living out my life the way that it was meant to be. And uh, that is an invitation to get off the crazy train. All right. Susanna Almal, thank you for your devotion. Where's I woke up this morning and I tell you what. I must have been sleepy because I walked all over the house. I looked in several different rooms, went outside to my car, trying to find my Bible. And you know where my Bible was? Folks, you know where my Bible was. It was right next to me the whole entire time. It was covered up by another journal that I had. And so we're currently working on cleaning out the stack of stuff. All right. We actually, and by the time we get to the show, we've cleaned up so many things. I don't even have a Bible here on the set. And so John 8. 36, if the sun shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. And to just finish off the thought that we have for today, let's 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 focus on pleasing the Lord, walking in the freedom that he gives, the freedom of mind, the freedom of disposition, the freedom of knowing that we are his in Christ. And so if there's anybody that's out there today who is not in Christ, You've not recognized uh, the weight of your sin. You've re not recognized the stain and the guilt of your sin. And you're recognizing that today and saying, hey, I need a savior. I need to be lifted up from this burden. I need to be lifted up from under the burden of trying to please every dang body in the world except pleasing God. Then you can turn in faith today from your sins and trust Jesus to be your savior. Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verse 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. If that is your desire today, and if that is your inclination to step into the arms of Jesus, would you uh, just follow in faith, uh, repenting of your sins and saying, I don't want those. I want Christ. All right. Bible time is now almost officially done, big kid. Did we finish Bible time well? All right, a couple comments in the comment section, and then we're going to get to our top story. Alvaranga is watching today, and he says, we hear, hey, I'm talking about teachers today, and the reason why I couldn't get an actual teacher big hand on the show today is because the teachers who are actually still in school are teaching today. And so let's get to our top story since they're here. They're here. They're watching. They're a part of this experience, and so let's go. Top story, big head. Let's go. All right, top story for today, we're gonna to be talking about teacher shortages. And here's an article for the show notes and the show links that are here. You guys can check out all of these different things in the show notes for this particular show. And uh, I wanna watch a little bit of sound today. And then we're gonna make some comments and re some reactions. I'll be stopping the video uh, partway through this to just get your audience reactions to this, but let's get going self ragged. I went from someone who was happy to someone who was overwhelmed. I got so burnt out. Over the last two years, more than 600,000 educators have called it quits. I quit teaching because um, I was overextended. Our commitment became even more emotionally um, taxing. Long days grew longer during the pandemic. Today we're working on less than 22.4. Before the pandemic, it was a 50-hour work week was pretty typical, and I felt like I was on top of my job and doing things well. Well, that certainly gives a sense of why people enjoy this show. Very engaging, very heartfelt. We will return to the conversation in a few moments, but first, let's thank our sponsors and you for all your awesome support. Moody Radio's Dawn and Steve Morning Show, Life Action Ministries, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and Holt International. Thanks so much to our partners who make such a difference. All right, let's get back to the show. This is where it gets good.
Um, a little bit on this article here of what we're looking at today in terms of teacher shortages. Now, it's hard for me to ask teachers because the teachers right now who I would be asking and the ones that I would actually bring as in a panel on the show are teaching right now. So the ones who aren't teaching, maybe retired teachers, how many hours of week do or did you, or if you're a teacher and you're retired and you're watching this and you're like, hey, I, I was a part of that. I'm no longer a part of that. How many hours a week did you put in in reference to teaching? Because we've got a teacher that's on here was saying, you know, 40, 50 hours a week was pretty standard, pretty normal. Felt like he was on top of the job, felt like he had everything graded, communication with everybody, good rapport with students. And then after the pandemic or during the pandemic, it began to be 70 hour work weeks and then upward and upward and upward. And then some people, you know, 70, 80 hour work weeks every week, the toll and the taxation upon you. How many hours a week did you, if you can have firsthand experience and maybe when you taught, how many hours a week did you spend teaching, preparing, engaged in the occupation of teaching? I would really like to know that. Uh, jump in the comment section. If you've been a teacher before or if you are a teacher currently, presently, I would love to know. I, I'm just curious. We're just curious on this show. How, and we're going to talk about money here in just a second. But in proportion to the time that you spent teaching and then also in relationship to the funds that were given to you, was that appropriate? Any comments, any thoughts on that as well? I'm going to watch a little bit more of this interview. I've got some reactions to this. Um, obviously, I think in, in professions that matter, and <laughs> this is not a disrespect. If you're watching this and you're a Christian music artist, if you're any type of artist, what you do matters, how you engage audiences and how you present, especially if you're a Christian music artist, how you present Christ and how your presentation of music, even the creative side of music, even if you're not saying the name of Jesus, how you do that says something about God. And so that it is an occupation and a vocation that matters. But in the service of other people mattering type of things like police officers, <laughs> how that their uh, occupation affects others. Um, firefighters, you know, service industry type people, principals of schools, teachers. And I'm not making a gradation here because all of us have gifts the Lord has given us and we all use the things that God has given us to be able to advance the kingdom. But I'm saying in professions that like matter, because if we don't have teachers, we don't have education, we don't have education. Uh, we're, in a, <laughs> we're, in, we're in a bad situation. Would you not agree with that, big head? We're in a bad situation. Yes, Big Head agrees with that. So in these professions that matter, there's always going to be, and this is my point, there's always going to be a discontinuity between saying, hey, we're going to hire a teacher that's going to work 40 hours a week. Well, a good teacher is not only going to work 40 hours a week. Conversely, someone that matters, also pastors. We're going to hire a part-time youth pastor. I was a part-time youth pastor. I sometimes did 50 to 80 hours. It just, it just depended on when it was. Um, that's not part time. But at the same time, for people who matter and who engage in other people's lives, you always give more than what the job description requires. And so is that it's just it's normal. I think that's just standard. Like you because of, you're in a position where you're giving yourself so that other people can gain through your knowledge and through your expertise. You're always going to be, I believe, spending more time than pay amount or the contractual agreement requires you to spend. Can I get some comments on that this morning? What are your thoughts on that? I've got a couple of things. Mashi says that I, and let me get that comment on the screen. If we don't have good teachers, we could be in trouble. Parents are to be the primary teachers. And let's get some more sound here because I want to, I want to talk about that in specific. So let's get a little bit more sound on uh, this we are watching here and let's get to connect content with students at various levels um and then lack of support with like special education teachers as well stop it's the hard. tape stop students the tape started showing academic stop the, and behavioral problems stop the, stop, the stop, the stop, the stop the tape stop the tape stop the tape okay <laughs> stop it six a second hold on before we get into some of these fights. 
the place where I worked, so I did almost a decade uh, because I was part-time as a youth pastor. I did almost a decade in substitute teaching and I did every grade and I did some sort of longer substitution uh, assignments in, in that process. But I will say also when the school district hired me on as a paraprofessional, those of you who are watching this show who remember Erskine in the school district, I thought they suckers, man, they hired, they full-time hired me and gave me the highest salary that I've ever seen to take care of just a few kids. And it was in special ed. And I will just go ahead and say much to my surprise. <laughs> I thought I got over on you, but you got over on me. All right. So the amount of work that is there, the amount of things that is required, and she specifically mentioned special ed. That is an area near and dear to my heart. Those those students, if you're watching this today, if you're a productive member of society because you have had instruction. <laughs> All right. If you're in jail today because of what it is that I, I'm not going to take any credit for that, but if you're a successful human being as a result of what it is that I did when I was working with you in the public school. Uh, we are definitely excited about that. But I, I, I wanted to I mention that to just simply say that there are certain teaching jobs that require supernatural, <laughs> is supernatural the right word? Superhuman effort. And if you're watching this today and you're working with uh, special ed, if you're working with behavior intervention, if you're working in those departments where you're developing IEPs and meeting diagnosticians, my hat goes off to you. And if you're still working in those after a few years um, and you're still alive, then the Lord loves you. And I'm going to pray for you <laughs> that, that would continue in your life because that is super hard. And she mentioned some of this. Now we're going to get to fights. We're going to get to that. Come on. Let me get to the comment section here. Make sure that we're being good to everybody. All right, let's get some more sound on this uh, in this article that we're following today Here's on teachers. Example. You said there are things going on in the classroom. Physical assault, um, ridicule by by admin in, in certain areas. It's things that I think no, no professional should have to endure. I went from a teacher who uh, never had a child fail the state exam to experiencing my first students failing the state exam. And outside pressures make teaching even tougher. Battles over masks and vaccines trickled from TV screens into classrooms. The politics are getting into it, and it's just kind of really, a really negative place. Tough. All right, let me get a sound on this. I uh, wanted to make a couple of comments related to um, school environment. I think I did this a little bit earlier when we talked about uh, Rob Elementary and the kids in Uvalde going back to school on the first day of school. We prayed for them. Um, but I wanted to give some sound, at least some thought to this whole idea of the environment of schools. Now, it was not uncommon, I would say, for there to be a fight at school. Those of you who know, I'm going to keep it a buck on this. If you've known me for very long, I can have a, probably a panel of my friends come out and say, Erskine. You were one of the biggest fighters <laughs> back in your schoolyard days. Um, you know, elementary school was a little tough for me. Uh, I would say the first part of middle school was pretty tough for me. I had some, and I'm not making excuses for it. I just had some life things that were going on that were difficult. I didn't handle them well. I didn't handle other people's intervention and interaction well. And so I'm so thankful I always give a big shout out to those people who have supported me and who have loved me through the years. People who got me into sports, people who got me into music. You're watching the Erskine Music Show as a derivative of the fact that there are people who shepherded me in those areas and, and guided me in some productive ways of handling life. So I was a big brawler. But has the school environment these days, so far as we know, become more toxic in terms of people fighting classroom management, behavior, some of those issues that never used to arise, at least I hear people say they never used to arise, where students will literally physically assault teachers. And then not only that, 
but they will assault the teachers and then have no repercussions as a result of that. Is this the environment that we're in? Have you heard stories like that? Have you been a part of stories like that? And again, I'm doing this on the teacher shortage, knowing that there are teachers who would very well, I can think of about five or six teachers who I would call and I would say, hey, just start, set up a panel and we would just discuss these things. I, I still know a lot of teachers who are in the teaching public school and private school profession, but they're not here to, to speak on their behalf. And so maybe retired teachers, maybe stories that you've heard, maybe you're a parent and you're interacting with teachers and hearing some of the stories that teachers are saying, what say you about these things? What's, what's, what's going on here in the classrooms in terms of behavior, in terms of uh, intervention, in terms of classroom management? I'm, I'm going to venture to say, big head, I'm going to venture to say this. I'm going to venture to say that classroom management has gotten more difficult over the years. Yes? No? Yes? Excellent. Absolutely excellent. Okay. Let's get some more sound on this. And then we're going to have some Erskine music. Got a giveaway today. It's fun. All right. Uh, jobs with little room for financial growth. I think teacher pay is an issue across the nation. No, we did get some one-time bonuses, but they were very small. Still, the decision tugging at the heart. It's hard on you even now thinking about it. Yep, yep. Um, yes. <laughs> I'll need to give me a moment. We are told you don't, you're doing this for the kids. Like, what about the kids? And at some point, it's like, well, what about my family? What was the best <clears throat> part of teaching for you? The way that children love on you. The best part of the job is definitely the kids, the students. It was helping them um, figure out what it is that they needed the most. With them, more than their own parents a lot of times throughout that day. <clears throat> and so you do, you build like a little family in your classroom. I think teaching really helped me find the best of myself. Saying good. Hey! All right. Hey. <laughs> hey. The best part of teaching is the kids. Notice they didn't say the parents. And Mayoshi, we're going to get back to your comment here in just a moment. They didn't say that it was administration. They didn't say that it was the hard work, the long hours, all the different things. All of that is worth it because the kids are so amazing. I'm going to have to echo that sentiment, having taught in the public school, recognizing that there are some wonderful, and I would think I get a chance to rub shoulders with people, literally, some of the students, and I've kept track with some of the students, missionaries who are working in the field, people who are working in higher levels of government and politics, um, students who are themselves teachers, and I thought to myself, huh, I remember when I used to teach them, and now they're like they're the teacher. Like <laughs> it's not like somebody's teaching them to be the. Te they're like the teacher. And the next generations of education is just a beautiful thing to see. People who are principals now, people who have gone on and they played sports. I've had students from my student ministry who have gone on and they played sports, uh, semi-professionally, and it's just amazing. Students, hey, big shout out! Come on, you got no excuse. You're one of my students, you got no excuse. We're not making excuses. And I told you all along, nobody's making excuses for you. Just go out and get it done. And I told many of the students who were in my classroom, one of these days, I'm going to go and I'm going to do music and I'm going to reach a lot of people. And there were a couple of students in class that laughed at me, but there were a couple of students that said, Mr. Erskine, we think you can. <laughs> and so big shout out to you guys. <laughs> Students, 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 teachers, teachers, teachers. Now let me deal with Miyoshi's comment in relationship to the fact that she's taking a very biblical understanding of the fact that God, God is the one who has given us our children as arrows, shooting them things in the world. But it is our primary responsibility to be the educators of our children, both in their education, what they are taught, and in their discipleship, what is called from watching their lives and being under the tutelage of their parents. Still, study after study after study after study, models and models and models and dollars and dollars and dollars. Oh, um, study after study shows that parents are still the most 
primary influencers in their kids' lives, even when they begin to reach a stage like ours, 14, 15 now, they're a little gritty, they're a little, you know, snarky from time to time. But still, even in that, don't franchise your kids away to let the professionals handle it. You are still very much involved in, and I believe biblically, and this is to my Oshie's comment, very much responsible for the instruction of your kids. Now, some parents choose to do that in a private school, parochial school, homeschool. That's the environment that we've chosen to educate our kids and really almost by necessity educate our kids in homeschool because, you know, <laughs> the way Erskine music be traveling these days, we wouldn't see them, them jokers. And that's unacceptable. I know that I've got to be more primary in their lives than just, hey, here. Well, you probably already know that when you hear that sound, there's music on the way. After all, this is kind of a music show. Sit back and enjoy. All the music can be easily found on your favorite digital distribution channels. Turn up the volume and here we go. Get back to the show. You know that I love the profession of teaching. Uh, wait a minute. Where's our sound effects? 
you know that I love teachers and I think that they are ground zero. They are in the trenches every single day. Teachers, coaches, people who have direct interface and will have direct interface today with those kids who come from broken homes, from abuse situations, from poverty, from homelessness, and they will be the only kind word that they hear today, the only voice of reason, the only voice of interaction that they're going to experience today is going to come from that teacher who is going to give them hope that they can make it back tomorrow, that they can make it through their assignment, that they can make it. Wait a minute, I'm preaching up in this thing. Gospel choir. It just does my heart good. All right, so because you know that I believe all of those different things, and you know, teachers, if you're out there, we love you on this show. We love you. But I must say this. I don't love everything about the teaching profession. I don't love the public school curriculum. Can I just go ahead and say that? Wow, really? Like, I grew up at a time, let me just speak directly to the camera. <laughs> I grew up at a time when we didn't have the best and most comprehensive education. But let me be clear about this. Back when I grew up, we knew what a boy was and we knew what a girl was and we knew which bathroom to go into based on our gender and we knew which team to play on and we knew, we knew a lot of different things. We didn't know everything. We couldn't have known everything. We didn't know everything, but we did know some basic things. Come on. What the censorship button? Are we teaching our kids in this present level in area of curriculum and in relationship to math and some of the ways that we're teaching reasoning? But we're not teaching reasoning. <laughs> my, my bad. We're not teaching reasoning. And in some of the ways that we are talking about Processing life, gender dysphoria, confusion that is introduced by, I'm going to get this show banned. I'm a, I'm just about to throw this show into a place where nobody can win. Okay, I'm going to calm the heck down because if I throw this show into a place where I want to go with this uh, comment, I'm not going to be able to do my giveaway and it won't be a fair giveaway because half the audience will be gone because... You know, the powers that be, the eye in the sky is watching the show to shut this thing down. So let me calm the heck down and just say, I don't love the curriculum of public schools. Get back down here. I don't love public school schedules. And I say that to just say this. As somebody who is thought of as maybe after this show, they won't think of me as a community leader that is concerned about a faith-based leader who's concerned about education, the community, how communities come together, especially in the area of Nashville, Metro Nashville public schools. I don't love the schedule, but I do understand that we're, we're vying for and looking at some of the same issues. The school wants to be and feels like it needs to be a surrogate parent to some of these children who come from broken homes, who have poverty, who have transitional issues, who have a variety of issues. And so the length of the day before school, after school programs is there to become a deterrent from these kids getting involved in deleterious things. And uh, certainly that's a commendable thought, but also for those students and families, there's a disproportionate amount of time in which students are taken away from their family and educated in a curriculum that I quite honestly think is just poo. It is just absolutely doo-doo. Oh! As the comment came across a little bit earlier in reference to parents being the primary educators of their children, I, I do believe that. We do believe that. We do practice that. But I think sometimes the way that the schedule is set up where we begin to prioritize all these other things that take kids far away from the family, take them just hour wise away from the family. Um, that's something that I don't love about public school. 
um, we're finding that in generally about four to five hours, we can get twice the amount of work done that most people get done in an eight hour day of public school. A lot of wasted time, a lot of shifts that are taking place there. And look, I know I've heard, I've sat in the meetings before, and I know that you guys have a, a concern for, you know, we're going to pick these kids up on the bus. They're going to come home. There's going to be nobody there. Uh, nobody there means that they're getting involved in all these different things. And so there is a concerted effort to become a surrogate parent. But we've got to do something about the school schedule. And for those schools that say, hey, we're going to have you separated from your family for eight, 10 hours a day. And we're going to send homework on top of that. So they're spending another one, two hours at home. Stop that nonsense. We got to figure out some kind of way to enfranchise families and for and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and run for president of the United States here. Come on, let's go. Let's kiss babies and run for the president of the United States. I'm going to come up when I'm president of the United States. I'm going to come up with a system in which parents can be more proactively involved in their kids lives. And if their kids and if they want to take this course of action, even in the public school, they're going, going to allow students to spend an inordinate amount of time with their families. Now, for those families that don't have you know, parents who are heavily involved or can't be involved because of their work schedule, we are going to provide some services and some activities and some mentors and, you know, some offshoots of what it is that we're doing in the educational paradigm. But that's only going to be as it relates to creating a relationship with the nuclear family. Um, and so we're going to have different tiers and different tracks. And yes, it is going to give an advantage to those whose parents are more proactively involved. But the last thinking time I checked, the kids who have an advantage are the ones who have parents who are more proactively involved. Anyway, across the board, that's what we want. And that's what we're trying to on-ramp people to, to see the benefit of having parents, teachers, community, staff, all involved, working together. And that's what we're going to create when I'm president of the United States. We have come to the end of this episode. Don't miss a final word from Erskine. Hey guys, tell your friends about this show. And as always, I look forward to your interactions. Please contact us as you are able. We love to hear from you. Okay, friends, let's go and make a difference.